Hello and welcome back to Bicycle Legs and another edition of In Defence Of. And today I have a guest for this show and that's Peter Kerr from Rock Daydream Nation. Hi Peter, good to have you on the channel again. How's it going down in Sydney tonight? It's going pretty well. Um, beautiful day. It's right in summer and um, yeah, looking forward to talking about David Bowie. Yes. So today's album um, that we're going to be defending is David Bowie's 17th album and that is Never Let Me Down. Now, this is an album that the critics have not been kind to. It's one that a lot of Bowie fans don't like. It's also David Bowie's least favourite David Bowie album from everything I could gather. So, but as usual with this series, what we're going to be basically arguing is that this may not be cream of the crop Bowie, but it definitely gets a bad rap and it's a better album than people um, give it credit for. So just a little bit of background into the album. As I said, it was David Bowie's 17th album. He's very prolific in that early, because this is only 20 years from his debut. And it's already his 17th studio album, and he'd done at least two live albums as well. Um, it was released on the 20th of April, 1987, on EMI America. Uh, it was the third record of that deal that he'd done with EMI. It um, did pretty well on the charts, but not quite as well as the previous couple of albums. It got to number six in the UK, number 34 in the US, number 19 here in Australia. Certified gold in the UK and the US doesn't seem to be certified here in Australia. Maybe just somebody's never gotten around to certifying it. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through it track by track. Um, just talk about each song as we go along. Um, and then we'll have a bit of a, a sort of a summing up at the end of it. But I mean, the first thing I would say, Peter, and I think you'd agree with me in this, this is a vastly improved album to the one that came immediately before it tonight. Oh, 100%. Um, I've re recently did a show with Read Little on my channel about tonight. And uh, with the exception of Loving the Alien and, and maybe Blue Jean, it's a bit of a, a stinker. Um, yeah. I don't have a very high opinion. There are a lot of cover songs on that album. Yeah. I think he wasn't very... Uh, sort of artistically challenged it was sort of like he had this high of let's dance which was mm. a commercial high watermark for him um and you know highest selling album um i may be wrong but tonight i think he was like in a bit of a an artistic lull yeah and, well um yeah tonight always struck me as an album that he kind of tossed off fairly quickly in order to keep touring he didn't That's tour off that across. album. Yeah, no, maybe he wanted to, but he didn't actually tour off that album. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. But yeah. It, it did seem very sort of an offhand album, whereas I think this album really, for better or worse, Bowie threw himself into this album. So... As you can see with the album cover, yeah, it actually think, is. It's everything yes. but the kitchen sink, and he's actually throwing himself, himself into in it. the camera, yeah. Yes, so um, what we'll do is we'll go through it track by track um, and it starts off with Day In, Day Out. So what are your thoughts on that song, Peter? Well, here's the 12-inch. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. So it's uh, a different Bowie. It's mm. uh, a Bowie that's uh, socially very observational. It's an, uh, a song about homeless people. It's a what you wouldn't expect the Bowie of Let's Dance of 1984 to put as a first single. Mm. Uh, it's got a, a nice hard rock backbeat. It's kind of memorable. I like it. I think it's a it's a really, if you look at the lyrics, he's in, you know, very sort of um, some strong words. I yeah. think he's really got his uh, sort of uh, heart on his sleeve about what he sees as the, the plight of certain people, um, you know, the underclass, especially in America, because this is a very American album. Yeah. This is not an English album. This is um, very American. Uh, and it's, you know, I, I, I sort of relate it. There's some songs on it that are very New York 
on the East Coast and there's some songs that are very West Coast. This is a very hard song. And I think this, to me, is like very L.A. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's a really good um, opening track. And um, I remember seeing the video clip. It was quite uh, confronting. Mm. Had a lot of sequences with the police and, um, you know, the helicopters and a lot of flash. But it probably didn't get the right sort of uh, cut through in 1987 to, you know, get it up like Let's Dance and those earlier yeah. more commercial hits. I wonder if the lyrical content had something to do with that. It's something that he would definitely sort of go on even further, sort of both in the confrontational nature and the social commentary nature uh, with the first Tin Machine album. But when you think about it, what was what was the flavour of the month of 87? Public Enemy, Run DMC, there was a lot of hip-hop that are very socially conscious uh, and that sort of uh, lyrics were becoming more prevalent and you're seeing a lot more of that on MTV. So I'm just wondering, yeah. you know, sort of subliminally, was he trying to tap into that sort of lyrical content but in his wheelhouse? I'm not sure. Possible. I mean... The first thing I said about this song and the very first thing that came to me when I was giving this another listen mm. was very 80s drums. They're, they're, you know, suit that super produced drum sound. Yeah, I know. Um, and I said, it's, it's, a, it's a banging up-tempo opening track. I think it works really well to kick off the album. As I say, it's funny that it... it um, you know, as you say, the lyrical content is, you know, sort of social commentary about homeless people and all that sort of thing. But musically, it's for that time, I think, a very commercial sounding track. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, um, and I, I thought the female backing vocals on this song sort of harken back a little bit to the Young Americans. Uh, yes. Period. Yes. Um, it's, yeah, one of the most commercial songs on the album, I think. And, um, and a really strong vocal from Boeing. How do you feel listening to it with 2023 20, years with that production, the the gated drums? It and does the, sound a the, little dated. And that I think in I, I did a, a show on this with Reed Little. Um, it was one of my first shows on Rock Daydream Nation, and um, I was bringing, trying to defend it and saying that I love that Trevor Horn mm. '80s production where it's everything but the kitchen sink and. Everything comes back in fashion. So yeah. who's who who are we to say in 2023? It might be, oh, you know, it's it's just too over the top. But in another 10 years' time, maybe in vogue. Everything yeah. comes back, you know. Who knows? So the next song is Time Will Crawl. Um I love this song. Yeah. Love it. I think it's top shelf Bowie. I think yeah. it's one of his best songs and this is the only song that he has actually defended and said that he has uh, an absolute soft spot so if there are any Bowie compilation albums this album gets widely ignored except for that song it yeah. always makes the compilation and it's got a life of its own so like tonight was a stinker of an album but um loving the alien has seen has grown critical acclaim and got a life of its own this song has also um over time people have just regarded it as a, a bit of a, a masterpiece so yeah. i think it's probably top 20 bowie for me i love it That's very dark cool. lyrics it's about chernobyl yeah so which was very happening but you can read it both um both you can relate it to different sort of um, experiences, not necessarily to that that story about Chernobyl, but I find it quite moving, quite melancholy. I love the keyboard lines. It just sort of, it just sort of, uh, it's emotionally effective. I think it's one of, yeah, it's yeah. track two. It's my opinion, the best song on the album. Well, there you go. I, I said I really loved the the synth riff. At the beginning of this song, it's it's one of my favourite things on this album, that synth riff. Yeah. Um, again, very sort of mid-80s production. One thing I will say about the production, and it's sort of something I kept coming back to, 
whatever you say about the production, again, comparing it with the previous album tonight, at least this album has sort of a consistent production sound throughout the whole of it, whereas uh, tonight sounds like a hodgepodge. Um, and that's because he did use three or four different producers on that album. Three or four different producers and, you know, just sort of, you know, duets with Tina yeah. Turner, really badly chosen cover songs like that rendition of uh, God Only Knows is, oh, yeah, yes. God, God Only Knows. I mean. That, that'd be a bottom 10 Bowie song for me. So there you go. Yeah. Because I adore that song. I mean, the Beach Boys version of that song is just heavenly. Well, but... Reed Little defended it, mm-hmm. so uh, check it out. Check Reach out the clip. But I, I mean, yeah, I will uh, definitely <laughs> leave a link in the description to that video. <laughs> um, I, I said that this one could have. I, I felt like this could have fit in on side one of Let's Dance. It definitely has that sort of a. Mm. quality and a sound to it um it's a really good track i don't know if i'd go quite so far as to say top 20 like you did but it is a very good song yeah. no doubt um the next one is beat of your drum disco brat follow the pack i love his turn of phrase he's got these little yes. phrases and i don't know i'm a sucker for when david bowie talks about fashion and yes. fame um, he's sort of like a barometer of what's happening in the yeah. world. And it's a, it's a nice little story about a Lolita character and, um, you know, a trendsetter. And, yeah, I like his turn of phrase on this. Um, this uh, I actually saw the show. I saw the uh, Glass Spider show in the Sydney Entertainment Centre. He brought the whole oh, cool. bells and whistles. Uh, the choreography was done by one Tony Basil. Yes. Um, it was an extravaganza. It was more theatre than a rock concert. Mm. And you had this big glass spider overhanging and um, the band was crack, a crack band. You had Peter Frampton. So tick, seen Peter yeah. Frampton. Um, Charlie Sexton, remember? He was like uh, mm. big in the 80s for about five minutes. He was in the oh, band yeah, that as song, well. Um, Beat So Lonely. Yes. Yeah. Um, he came in, they wheeled him in, and I, I did a few Iggy songs. I think I Want to Be Your Dog. But it was just, you know, to an 18 year old, one of the, those early concerts, it left an impression on me. And uh, uh, I've got the uh, concert on DVD and um, it's it, it, it holds up. Would I rather see Bowie in the 70s? Would I rather see Bowie in a more traditional concert setting? Hell yes. But for what it was, mm-hmm. um, it was a lot of fun. And I, I, I guess I've got a lot of a, a bit of a sentimental attachment to this album. Yeah. And um, when I listen to the, the songs, it reminds me of certain things. And the beat of your drum had a very sort of like a, a video clip uh, dance routine done by Tony Basil. He had all these dances behind Bowie and, uh, yeah, yeah, it was good. Yeah, I mean, that concert tour was very controversial at the time because it was considered to be over the top and overblown and all that sort of thing. And But, I mean, what did they expect from Bowie? I mean, seriously. Yeah. You know, I... I you know, the man was an entertainer as well as an artist. So. I mean, God damn it. It's, we're talking about the 80s, uh, Bicycle Legs. Like uh, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, there were 200 remixes of, uh, yeah. what was it, Two Tribes. Two Tribes Everything yeah. was over the top in the 80s. Exactly. <laughs> now, I, I said with this song I, that I like the juxtaposition between the sort of the atmospheric moody verses and the upbeat sing-along choruses. Mm. Um melodically um parts of it remind me of earlier bowie some of the like the the uh, chord changes that he uses mm. not not the sound of it but just the sort of some of the chord changes that he uses in that song and he sings um, beautifully don't you reckon yeah. he really sings beautifully on this album he's yeah, he does. really i mean you can criticize all the arrangements and the production but he vocally he's on the top of his game he's really good on this album and you know you were saying about the the disco brat Line. follow follow the pack yeah yeah that kind of reminds me of um the song teenage wildlife because that's what that whole song is about 
you know. Yeah, I love it when um, he's in that mode. Yeah. Um, what else did I say about this song? Um, yeah, I, it's pretty much what I've already said about the production being a, a consistent thing throughout the album rather than a hodgepodge like tonight. So, yeah, yeah it's a good song. You know, one of the things with this album too, and I'll bring this up now rather than waiting till the end, there are no ballads on this album. It's all mm. up-tempo stuff. And I like yeah. that, you know, because, because again, tonight was a very sort of, you know, a lot of yeah. it was kind of down-tempo and laid back. and Faux oh, reggae. Is, yeah. Which I loathe, faux mm. reggae. Yes. That, ugh. Um, I think the probably the next song is probably as close as a ballad you'll ever get. Oh, the title it, track, never let yeah, me down. Yeah. Yes. Which which is a nice song. It's about mm. his assistant. It's like a sort of a little sort of poem to her, which is which is nice. Yeah. That's as about as ballad as you would get. It's not a real mm. ballad, but yeah, slow tempo. Yeah. Absolutely. So what are your other thoughts I'll, on that song? I like it. I like it a lot. And mm. um, it's from the heart. It's direct. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a it's a really nice song, when, yeah. especially when you know about the background. And um, Bowie has been all, you know, the stories I read about him, he's always been very good with his entourage. Yeah. Uh, I've never heard somebody say a bad thing about him. Um and uh, you know the people that are, are close to him, and um, yeah, um, I think that's a really nice uh, sort of uh, kind of not a love poem, but a, a poem of, of affection and yeah. admiration to his assistant. Well, I I said that this for me is one of Bowie's best '80s singles. I love this song. Yeah. It's co-written by Carlos Alomar. Um, the harmonica to me is a little bit reminiscent of um, a new career in a new town from Lowe. Right. And which he would then go back to again for, um, uh, oh, what's the song? I've got it written down here. Uh, I can't give everything away on Black Star. I love the tone of the harmonica because mm. there's nothing worse than a bad harmonica, that squeaky yes. Stevie Wonder type sounding um tone but um i love it on this this song and and i like his um he's got a bit of falsetto yeah um, i think somebody said is he uh david are you trying to do the smoky robinson but i i think he sort of um no he said no i'm not doing that mm. so and for the record i love stevie wonder's harmonica playing but it's a bit squeaky <laughs> yeah <laughs> contrarian that's all right and I said it's a very a sweet but very simple lyric by Bowie standards. But you know, as as you said, you know, it's it's kind of a, a mm. if not quite a love letter, it's it's a a, a letter of affection to his assistant, mm. as you say. Yeah. Hello, yeah. Grace. Yes. Cat making an appearance. That's all right. <laughs> Be disappointed if it didn't. Um. So the next song is Zeros. Yes. Yeah, I think that's not a bad little closer. It's not the strongest um, song on the album. Mm. Um, I think he, he's sort of throwing all the different sort of cliches about um, his experiences, his life experiences into this one sort of um, song. I think he said it was kind of influenced by John Lennon. There's a lot of John Lennon influences. I think he was quite affected by him. Yes. Um, and earlier um, in this show, we were talking about uh, Black Tight, White Noise being another very reviled album. And there was mm. a song about John Lennon on that as well. Lennon was my brother. Was Anyway, I'm going yeah. off track here. But um, <laughs> Zero's, it, yeah, I, I get a bit of a Lennon feel about it. I'm not sure. What, what are your views on this song? Yeah, it's probably... <sighs> It might be the weakest song on side one. I still think it's a pretty good song, though. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I actually particularly like Frampton's solo on this song. I think it's yes. his best solo on side one of the record. Very tasty licks. Yeah. Um, you know, Frampton was an interesting choice for him as a guitar player. Um, Inspired. Yeah. Um, he was sort of like... <sighs> You know, from the 70s heyday, mid-80s, he was kind of washed up. Let's be mm. honest. He was in 
His albums were stiffing and he had so much enjoyment and exuberance on stage. You can sell, he was having the time of his life because, yeah. you know, they were old mates. They knew each other from the old days and uh, he just had this one thing I just remember all those years ago, he just had the biggest smile on his face and he was just having a ball. Yeah. And I a lot of Fram- them met, sorry. No, I was just going to say, I think Frampton's best as a guitar player. I was never particularly fond of his vocals, but that's just me. Too much vo- box box, eh? Uh, no, it's not that. I, I just, I don't know. I mean, you know, there were those two songs from Frampton Comes Alive that would get played on the radio just over and over and over again. Mm. And I just never particularly liked his vocal tone. Yeah. He was very metallic mm. on stage. So it did push the band into a more harder edge. Yeah. So he'd be doing little sort of uh, Eddie Van Halen licks and shreds, which I know you probably wouldn't like because he doesn't, that doesn't fall into the traditional David Bowie guitarist because I don't think David normally gravitates to those showy yeah. metal guitarists. But, uh, yeah, that's one thing I and I do remember that he uh, was going more of a hard rock edge in his uh, approach to guitar playing. Yeah. So that's side one. Side two starts off with the aforementioned Glass Spider, which inspired the name of the tour. Um, your thoughts on this one? Oh, musically, I like. Mm. Um, lyrically, it's a bit spinal tap. It's a little bit like Stonehenge. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah. I, I like that. I like the, um, this is the song that started off the show and the slow build up where it gets, you know, builds up and he, he does that David Bowie croon. Mm. <laughs> and, um, yeah, the, the lyrics, I don't really buy it. I love mysticism. I love that sort of dra- Dungeons and Dragons. But in the context of this song, it sort of sticks out. Yeah. Because as I said, this is an American album, East Coast, West Coast, social consciousness, observational lyrics, personal relationships. And then, bang, you've got this little funny ditty about glass spiders. It just, yeah, yeah. it's a bit bit odd. It is the odd one out on this album for for sure. I actually sort of said that he starts side two of the record with possibly the most experimental song he'd done since, you know, sort of Scary Monsters, um, as far as music goes. Yeah. Um, Give me you know, some of that, I'll tell you. Ooh. Yeah, well, I, you know, he would go back to that, obviously, but, um, yeah, um, you know, and also the other thing is that the sort of the spoken word start of the song reminds me of the opening of the album Diamond Dogs Mm. Um, you know and again I said you know some cool Frampton guitar on this song and um, of course you know he named the 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 infamous tour after this song so yeah I mean the spoken word it gives gravity to not much at all yeah I mean you know you could put Orson Welles on it and (laughs) <laughs> oh, talking about something quite important here. When when you look at it on paper, it's like oh, it's, it's a bit silly. Oh, the French champagne! Sorry, <laughs> you, that terrible Orson Welles ad. Yeah. Um, okay, so so the next song is "Shining Star." Making oh, I my love, love. I love this song, and yeah. I'll go contrary. And I love the Mickey Rock rap. It's just so deadpan, and it's like he's just in Angel Heart. He's playing a private detective, and he's. Uh, 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 yeah. I love it. It just, yeah, I love it. It's very. Do you like this old. song? Do you like this? Yeah, song? I do actually. Um, I think it's I one it's, of my favorite songs in the album. It's it's a very up tempo song on a very up tempo album, yeah. um, and I said the lyric is a sort of strange hodgepodge of of political references. And sort of mm. choruses about, and yeah, choruses about being a, the man of the dreams of someone, you know. Yeah. So it, it's a bit of a hodgepodge in that respect. But I mean, musically, yeah, I mean, it just, it's up tempo as all hell. It's real. And you know, his singing is be- his singing is beautiful, especially, you know, I can make you, what's that? Um, 
life is like a broken arrow, memory a swinging door, I could be your great misfortune, well, I could make you happy every goddamn single day of your life. And his voice is absolutely soaring mm. to the heavens. It's, it's great. Yeah, but um, I remember in the day, I think Rolling Stone or one of those Matt Rags, they were really giving it to uh, oh, Mickey Rourke. It's just horrible, but I thought it was just inspired because it needs that sort of counterpoint. Somebody very dis disinfected, um, deadpan delivery, yeah, which does a, a counterpoint to the very expressive David Bowie, and um, I think it's it's actually perfect. One thing I wanted to just quickly mention, I'm not sure if we were going to talk about it. Are you aware mm. that a David Bowie box set came out about within the last ten years, and they actually stripped this album completely back? Yeah, it was just in the last couple of years, I think. Um, yes. And, and yeah, I haven't heard that version of the album. So yeah, some of it works and some of it doesn't. And to me, maybe I've got more emotional attachment to the bells and whistles. Mm. I actually prefer this. But um, with that song, they had somebody completely different. Name escapes me. Um, our yeah. viewers may, may tell us, but yeah, it. A lot of this. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was completely stripped back and, um, you know, even almost semi-acoustic. And um, I think the people behind that project were saying, look, the songs are so good. It's just the production that kind of sucked in 87 yeah. and it, the songs stand on their own. But I was just wondering what your, if you had an opportunity to hear it or, or views on it. No, but, I haven't. Um, but I'm, I'm very much one for not. I, I don't like when they take an artist's catalogue and sort of radically remix it and stuff. I'm very much yeah. one for, you know, leave a, a piece of art, you know, with its flaws and what have you, you know, just leave so it So, like, let it be naked, that's not something that you'd like. You, you I, prefer that, that one, you let it that be. That one's an exception to the rule simply because that's how they originally wanted that album to be, you know. It was mm. only later on that they put on the sort of, you know, bells and whistles of, of Phil Spector and the orchestrations yeah. and all that sort of thing. But no, I'm more thinking of, um, and I'm um, sorry for our sort of overseas viewers who may not know this album so well, but um, there's, when they redid the Split Ends catalogue, they remixed Frenzy and Corroboree. Mm. And the Corroboree remix in particular, I just, no, they should have just left it alone. You know, yeah. I liked that album perfectly fine the way it was. Yeah. But um, yeah. yeah, well, they've they've really stripped it back. It hasn't been released as a standalone album, so you mm. can only get it in the in the box set. Yeah. Um, I've got the single. I was able to secure the single, um, but I'm who knows? It may come out as a standalone album, um, like a record store day presentation. Would you would you get it, or you probably avoid it? I don't know. I'd be in two minds about it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the next song is New York's In Love. Um, your thoughts on this one? New York, it's got that sound. Mm. There's a very sort of New York sound about it. And what's a New York sound? Horns, sax, a um, lot of R&B influence, yeah. the David Letterman band. I don't know. It's It's kind of, yeah. I don't think it's the strongest song on the album. I have preferences but uh, to me this reminds me of uh, you know cocktail hour type music and that's not necessarily a bad thing he's mm. you know he was uh, very much of the time and yeah yeah what do you I think had, of this one i had to say it's not one of the best songs on the album in my opinion um yeah. it's got a danceable beat and it's catchy but it just doesn't have yeah. an awful lot else going for it in my humble opinion not, um, not a strong lyric. It's just New York's in love, cuckoo, cuckoo, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's probably the, the probably the closest thing on this album to a bit of a throwaway, which you know, I mean, the album's forty eight minutes long on vinyl. It's fifty three minutes long on CD. You know, perhaps he could have done without it. Who knows? But it's well. There. There's a song on the album which he actually threw off, and we'll talk about that. Are you oh, including okay. that in our little? I hadn't intended to, but feel free to I'll, talk about I, it. I, end, I, so. I will. I will. Yeah. Yeah. So the next song is 87 and Cry. So 
Yeah. What are you, what are you, I'm throwing to you. What do you think of um, songs that have years in it? Do you think Um, it it kind of dates it or it can do? Um, It depends how it's used. Um, I mean, some, some songs it's, you know, it becomes iconic. I don't think this is necessarily one of them, but yeah, it's, it's always a bit of a, you know, it's a gamble. Yeah. I think this song, you can start to see that the album's starting to peter off a little mm. bit. Um, I don't think this is one of the strongest songs. It's a little bit of a mid-tempo rocker. Um, I don't think it's got a lot to distinguish itself. Um, it was, from memory, this was uh, about Thatcher. Yeah. So he was doing a pot shot across the across the pond at uh, Thatcher and all the things that were happening in the UK while he was in New York. So, again, a bit of social commentary. But I just think the musically, it's not that interesting. And mm. whatever social commentary and interesting lyrics kind of get bar- buried. And let's face it, if the music's not interesting, um, the social commentary and the, the incisive lyrics are not going to come out. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be a little bit contrarian. I, I don't think it's the best song on the album, but I don't think it's the worst either. I, I think it's, mm. you know, I, I did say that up to this point in the album, it's probably the most overtly sort of rock song, whereas a lot of the album is more sort of aimed at the dance floor. Mm. Um, you know, it's one that I think, again, harkens back to sort of let's dance a little bit. Mm. Um, occasionally, Frampton reminds me not so much in the way he's playing or the tone of his guitar, but just, I don't know, there's just hints of some of the stuff that Stevie Ray Vaughan did on Let's Dance that I feel they have parallels. Like they're not, they don't sound the same, but they have Mm. the same sort of context within the music, if that makes any sense. Yeah, Stevie Ray Vaughan, his his guitar work on Let's Dance was just sublime and Mm. he had a tone that was just completely unique and yes. those guitar solos on that on those hit singles conquered america and actually created a, a career for him so yeah. um yeah that's a bold statement i'll have to um i'll re-listen to the album and as i say there's sort just of context. hints of it there here and yeah. there. it's not it's not an overt thing that yeah. goes throughout the album it's just little bits and Lots. Yeah, but my as I said, my recollection, and it's on video. The the full length video was released on VHS and DVD. Was live in Sydney, and it's yeah. on YouTube. Um, if you watch it, you'll see that um, it's very metallic. He's got a very metallic tone, so yeah. he loves doing. He's got the big permed hair, and <laughs> I guess the what was happening in eighty seven hair metal you know it was all very heavy metal and then you know he feels like he's got to keep up up with the joneses and um there was just a lot of fretboard shredding yeah that's my recollection fair enough so the next song is too dizzy i don't mind this song Mm. yeah i like it it's got a it's a bit uh retro a bit of a doo-wop i like the the doo-wop bit with the uh the chorus um i think it's playful um yeah, I actually prefer that to 87 and Cry and New York's in Love. So, yep. yeah, I think it's a very playful song and, you know, don't take it too seriously. But, um, um, yeah, I wouldn't sort of why, know why it would be dropped. That was the song that was dropped, correct, is it? Or Sorry? Was, uh, no, no, two... no, it wasn't that no, none of the songs were dropped for the CD version. No, they just shortened the length of some of them. Like right the okay songs are still on the cd it's sort of like um i don't know if you into dire straits at all but uh, they did that with um brothers in arms it had the same number of songs on it but there were shorter versions on the vinyl than there were on the cd right still would have been the same album <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it's playful i like it yeah. um i know he didn't like it and uh, I've read some articles and where he does a track by track. And uh, I think he really regarded that song as bottom of the barrel as a throwaway. But David, yeah, there's a lot worse mm. tonight. But um, yeah. yeah, I like it. Do you like this song? 
Yeah, I do. It, this one was co-written with Erdal Kislicke. I'm probably absolutely destroying the pronunciation of. His He's name very also. much in the David Bowie fold. Yeah, for that period. Oh, he absolutely. was quite, I mean, quite, in, quite influential. If you look at the um, credits on this album, there's three main instrumentalists credited, and that's Carlos Al- Alomar, uh, mm-hmm. Erdal Kislicke, and Peter Frampton. Yeah, and then the rest are sort of like in smaller font as additional yeah. musicians, including is that a, Bowie. A repress, is that a repress or a it's first? a UK pressing? All right. What's the, what's the label? Oh, let's do a little bit of Tim Dooling. Let's... Yeah. It's a EMI America. But, yeah, um... that's mine. First pressing it came out. Looks like yours. Oh. Yeah, no, mine's got the David Bowie logo on the, the on the actual nice label rather than just printed out name. Very good. Is that uh did you pick that up recently or you got that in no, the No, I've had this for a while. Yeah. Um Ooh. Yeah. So um too dizzy. Um I I, I said with this, I said I do love hearing sax on Bowie records, whether it's him playing it or someone else playing it. Um, I think you know, saxophone is you know key to Bowie's catalogue, you know, because he was a sax player himself. So just um not white tie, not, not black tie, white noise. No, no. But um the song. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I felt like it was a little bit generic. This song, um, I like it, but I don't love it. Yeah. Um, and and this is the point where I was sort of making the comments in my notes that side two just isn't quite as strong as side one. I, I agree with point. you. I agree with you completely. Um, it does peter out, but um, yeah, it's a bouncy song. It's a bouncy yeah. throwaway song, and he's done a lot worse. So it doesn't offend me. And then the last song on the official album, we'll talk about the one left off later, but um, the last song on the official album is Bang Bang. I got mine. Um, yeah, good song. Yeah, I don't mind that song. This was one I remember in the show, and he would be doing this little sort of dance routine Um Again, Tony Basil doing all the dance uh, routines. Um, yeah, that was sort of like a signature song in the show. So I think if you look at the song set of the uh, Glass Spiders, it was a very high quotient of songs off this album. Yeah, Even for those days where a band would be rolling into town and flogging an album. The quota would be about 40 to 50%, but in this album it was like 70%. So it was very much, um, you know, front and centre. And for a Bowie nut like me, I wanted to probably hear a bit more of, you know, um, Ziggy Stardust or Hmm. stuff off low or, yeah. Yeah. He he wasn't going to do that. So. But um, I, I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah. yeah. This is um, the one thing that it, this album has in common with tonight is that this is an Iggy Pop cover. You know, yes. Whereas he, you know, did three or four of those on um, on tonight. Um, it was originally on, I think, an underrated Iggy Pop album called Party. I quite like that record. It's not necessarily the very best thing Iggy ever did, but I think it's... Uh, Again, it could be a, a a subject for this series at some stage. I think it's we a should do album. a show on that because I like that yeah. album. Actually, a, I like a lot of Iggy's early eighties albums. Yes, um, um, Zombie Birdhouse. Ah, oh, yeah, I really really like that record. We, and if we do the show, we should put a little uh, maybe an excerpt of that clipped on countdown. Oh, from I'm bored. Yes, yes, <laughs> that's incredible. Um, I think this is a good album closer. I maybe slightly prefer Iggy's version, but it's a toss-up. Yeah. Um, again, you've got the sitar guitar on this one, which you had on um, on Zeros. Yeah, I'm not I a always, big... I don't know. I, I, I like I, the sitar guitar. I don't like the sitar. I think it's kind of cheese. I'm not a big fan, but I, I do like this song. I know I'm familiar with both and um, probably prefer this one slightly, whereas... On the Tonight album or the Iggy songs, I like the Iggy versions better. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Fair enough. 
as I said, it's a bit of a toss up for me. It depends yeah. what mood I'm in, I suppose. Um, and the only other thing I had to say about this song is that it's a, a rocking end to a very up tempo album with no ballads on. Yes. Um, Never Let Me Down is probably the closest to a ballad, as I said. Mm. It's getting there, but not quite. Um, it could be a ballad. He could have slowed it down. But, yeah, you're right. It's um, ballad-free. Maybe they yeah. should have put a sticker on the album. I don't know. So, so before we finish up, there was this extra song you wanted to talk about. No, you you tell me. What was the extra song? No, I, <laughs> I told you there wasn't an extra song. I, I think I was mistaken because oh, okay. I, I had it in my head too dizzy got dropped. Fair so enough. It wasn't dropped. So all up, all up um, you know, what are your thoughts on the album? I've got emotional attachment to it. I yeah. like it. I do recognise it is not top show, shelf Bowie, but it is far from the worst album. So, mm. look, I'd probably give it an 8 out of 10. Yeah. I, I like it. I really like it a lot. And, um yeah. I don't know. What about yeah. you? What would well, you give this album? Well, for people who've seen my Bowie top 10 will realise that this didn't make the cut of my... But then again, the man has 26 albums plus two with Tin Machine. So, hmm. you know, there were a lot of really quality albums that didn't make my top 10. But um, it's... Um, I think it's almost as good an album as Let's Dance. I mean, for the 80s, you know, the 80s commercial, it's a massive step up from tonight. Yes. Um, I definitely think there are, are definitely worse Bowie albums. I'd probably give it maybe seven and a half. Um, I think it's definitely worth hearing. As I said at the beginning of the, the show, I don't think there's any Bowie album that's anything less than interesting. No. Um, so I think every Bowie album is worth owning. But yeah. um and the critical think, panning was a bit yeah, yeah, that's something I can't really I find I found a bit of a head scratch. I was aware, were you aware in the day that it wasn't very yeah. well received? I, I found yeah. that a bit bit of a head scratch. No, I, I do remember at the time that people I think were getting a bit sick of the commercial Bowie and they wanted him to go back to doing something a little freakier. I yeah. mean, after this, he would sort of suspend his solo career for a number of years and do Tin Machine. Um, mm, which mm. was a, a different thing again for him and definitely the topic of a future video probably to talk Absolutely. about those two Tim Machine albums. Not very commercial, that album. No. Well, neither of them are. But, um, mm. yeah, I think it's definitely an album that you should go and have a listen to uh, with a fresh set of ears if you've not listened to it for a while and you're a Bowie fan, which I'm assuming you are if you've clicked on this video to have a look at it. Um, there's some really good stuff on here. It may not be sort of out there and experimental for the most part, mm. but there's some quality songwriting on here. And Bowie, as as Peter was been alluding to throughout the video, Bowie's vocals on this album are, are top shelf. He's Ab really singing beautifully on this album. Absolutely. And question for you, what's your favourite song on the album? Just one more for the viewers. What's your um, pick? Bicycle Legs pick. Ooh. I don't know. Um, I might go for something like, um, I don't know, either Shining Star or Beat of Your Drum. Those two songs I really, really like. Yeah, so, Time Will Crawl for me. So. Yeah. Yeah, each, each of those yeah, good picks. So there you have it. Please let us know in the comments what you think of this album, whether you're for it or against it. Um Please, if you're not already subscribed to Rock Daydream Nation, go and have a subscribe. Uh, I find it very hard to believe that any of my viewers aren't already subscribed there. But if you're not, link in the description. Um, please go and, and give you. Peter a, a, a like and um, go and watch some of his stuff because it's really, really good. I've been and this man's on it. Yeah, I've been lucky yep. enough to appear a number of times. If you want to see my appearances, on other people's channels, I have a tab in my um, playlists for appearances on other channels, which I keep updated with uh, videos as they drop. Um, please do like, share and subscribe. It really does help the channel out. If you're new to the channel, please go and have a look at some of my other videos. Go to those playlists. You'll see that I have a playlist for my other In Defense Of shows. You can go and have a look at those. If you want to look at my 
um, studio albums rank shows. There's a playlist for those, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you want to follow me on Instagram and Twitter, I'm at Bicycle Legs. Uh, on Instagram, I'm mostly posting the albums I happen to be listening to at the time, as well as posting channel updates. On Twitter, I talk about anything and everything, but I am definitely giving that more of a music focus. Thank you again, Peter, for coming on the channel. It's always Thanks a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.